The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, September 13th, 2022, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading. Joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. Today, Jim answers why inflation will remain persistent. At the time of this recording, Jim, CPI print has been announced 8.3% year over year, which shocked the markets again. I think inflation will remain persistent, and we want to go over that today. In the past, three factors have held down inflation, cheap labor, cheap goods, and cheap energy. Have all these factors reversed? Yes, I think that they have reversed, and I'd like to go over them one at a time. Let's start with cheap labor. So the chart we're looking at here is average hourly earnings, and this is real. This is after inflation. And what you'll notice is back in 1973, inflation adjusted, the average hourly earnings in the United States was uh, $9.38. The last print is $9.48. It's 10 cents higher after 49 years. And that's after it had a long period where it fell into the 90s. And that's, <clears throat> as it fell into the 90s, that's when we got the, the populist movement, the anger, because people's wages weren't moving higher. Now, why weren't their wages moving higher? is because we had immigration and we still have immigration. There was always a way to undercut you as far as finding somebody to do the job cheaper. And if it wasn't immigration into the United States, it was also globalization. There's always somebody in another country that's willing to do the job cheaper. And remember, as you undercut the lower ends of the scale, all the jobs above it, they also have a hard time getting a raise too. Um, Only when you really break out of that cycle into some unique kind of job and services or something unique like a professional athlete or something like that, are you immune from this? So it's really held down everything. But now if you go to the next chart, I think we're in a post-pandemic era. And I've talked about this on these podcasts before, that the economy is structurally different now post-pandemic than it was pre-pandemic. Structurally different. We have sped up a lot of the trends that we're going to talk about here. So what I'm discussing was going to happen, but it might have taken 20 or 30 or maybe 40 years, but instead it's taken two or three. <clears throat> and that, that amount of change is what we're struggling with. So right now we've got the unemployment rate of 3.7%. That is, nearly the, that is near the lowest level that we've seen in the post-World War II era, only in 1953. And basically last month in 2019 at 3.5% was lower than this. So we've pretty much got full employment uh, and we've got people's attitudes about jobs changing. I've talked about work from home here in this format a lot. And um, people have have had different attitudes uh, about it. I'll just give you one of many anecdotes that's in today's Uh, Bloomberg, that the union at the New York Times, which covers 1,200 of their employees, mainly all of their reporters, is basically pushing back and the New York Times trying to get everybody back into the newsroom. They want to stay at home. They're basically saying, you don't have to give me free lunch and all these perks come back in the office. Why don't you save it and just give me a raise and I'll just continue to work from home. That's one of many examples of how the workforce has changed. And with this low unemployment rate, what we have is a situation where Um, the worker for the first time in at least a generation is in the driver's seat. So if you go to the final chart on cheap labor, uh, this comes from the Atlanta Fed. The black line shows you overall wage growth, which is at 5.5%. So the average wage in the United States has gone up 5.5%. Hold that thought. We'll talk about that when we get to inflation because it's well below inflation. But the blue line is people's wage increases that did not switch jobs. That's 4.9%, it's less than average. And the people that do switch jobs have seen a 6.7% increase in their salary. So the bottom chart shows you the spread between job stayers 
in job switchers, and it's the highest ever. So there is a premium now on workers, so much so that if you want to fill a job, you're going to have to pay up. And that's what we're seeing. People are paying up existing workers. So the era of cheap labor, whatever the causes were, globalization, immigration, attitudes about jobs, that has changed now. We are at, un we are at low unemployment rates. We have a different attitude about work, and we're seeing premiums being placed on switching jobs, and we're seeing wage growth stay at 5%. Tell us about cheap goods. So cheap goods was the other thing. What's kept, you could look at the cheap labor argument and say, well, if people aren't getting a raise after inflation, why didn't we have a revolution in the country? Well, we almost did. We had the, we had the Tea Party movement. We had Occupy Wall Street. We had, we had uh, Trump. We had Brexit in the UK, they have much the same demographic problem that we've had. And so we've had a lot of people upset about it, but we've offset that with cheap goods, cheap goods from China. So this is the cumulative trade deficit between the Pacific Rim countries in blue and China in orange. Now, obviously China is part of the Pacific Rim, but China, we've seen them send us $6 trillion worth of goods. The overall pack rim has sent us 9 trillion. So two thirds of it's come from China. So no raise, you're being undercut by immigration, you're being undercut by globalization, but what has kept everything at bay? Everything kept getting cheaper and cheaper uh, at Walmart and at Target because we just kept making cheaper and cheaper stuff in Asia, putting it on a, a container ship and sending it to the United States. Now, if you jump to the next chart, a lot of this could be changing. First of all, China has a zero COVID policy. This is wreaking havoc with their economy. This is a chart from Goldman Sachs, and it shows the percentage of, comp of, of China's population that is in some form of high risk or lockdown because of their zero COVID policy. It is 35% of their GDP comes from areas that are in high risk or lockdown. That is the highest since 2020 when we were in the throes of the COVID lockdown. So their economy is really being hobbled by this zero COVID policy. And so if you go to the next chart, uh, you could see that this is China's GDP, year over year GDP, it goes back to 1980. China has only had one time when their GDP has contracted. That was COVID shutdown in 2020. They're very close to having it again happen. Now, and there's no COVID, there's COVID lockdowns now, but there is no outright shutdown. Their economy is struggling. Their economy is because they're 1.3 billion people and nominally, they're almost the size of the United States. The argument has been made that one of the reasons that energy prices, which we'll talk about in a second, especially crude oil prices, are so low, is that their demand is way off on it because of COVID zero. Otherwise, if China was humming at 6% GDP and they were having to suck up all that energy needs of a 6% GDP country versus a near zero, we might have a different uh, um, outlook on energy. But China is is not reliable because of zero COVID. And I don't have a chart for this. They're also not reliable because of the political angles. The tensions between the US and China are probably the highest they've been in our lifetime right now. They're not getting better. We've signed the $50 billion CHIPS Act to bring semiconductor production back to the United States. And just last week, the Biden administration put more restrictions on semiconductor uh, sales and on uh, other high-tech sales to China. And of course, we all know that they're doing military exercises around Taiwan and threatening Taiwan. So at longer term, China does not look like it is a safe place or not a safe place, but a reliable place to get cheap goods like it was pre-COVID. The post-COVID period has been very different. And how important is cheap energy? So if we go to the next chart, this uh, chart comes from Zoltan Pozar over at Credit Suisse, and he talks about Germany's commodity leverage. First of all, in manufacturing, it is important to understand the most important input is cheap energy to produce something. After that is labor, and that's actually a distant second. So what Zoltan's pointing out is $27 billion was spent in Germany on cheap energy, mainly natural gas from Russia, and they were able to leverage that into a manufacturing of $2 trillion worth of goods that they shipped to the rest of the world. And all of Europe 
has been able to survive with a manufacturing base based on cheap energy from Russia. But now that cheap energy is going away. Prices are up 6x. We're worried about what's going to happen this winter, as I've argued. If nothing else, the problem in Europe is they've already they've, they've filled their storage. They've got enough gas for this winter to heat their homes, but they paid 600% more than they did last year. Somebody's going to have to pay that 600% more, either through higher energy bills or either through taxation and bailouts. Higher energy bills will devastate the manufacturing. Think Stuttgart with Mercedes or, or Munich with BMW and seeing a 600% rise in energy inputs to make cars, they're going to have a real problem. So if you go to the next chart, um, the next chart shows you the current account balance in Germany. And I note, note uh, how it had been rising, cheap energy, their manufacturing base had been humming just like the rest of Europe. Then if you look at February and see that they had an $8 billion current account surplus, and this is on a rolling three-month basis by July, the latest dumb numbers, um, excuse me, that was uh, $60 billion. By July, it is down to $15 billion. It, it's falling off a cliff. They cannot produce with, this, with these high energy prices and maintain profits. So the problem here is what has been a bedrock of holding down inflation? Cheap labor, cheap goods, cheap energy. All of those seem to be reversing. And that is one of the reasons why I've been so worrisome that inflation will stay persistent. What about technology? Can it help offset these factors? Yes. So if we go to the next chart, I just threw this in there just to give people the percentage of the population that uses the internet. By the mid-1990s, it was still around 5% of the population. And now it's well over 80% of the population. And these charts are about five years old. I'm sure it's probably near 90% of the population right now. So another offset is technology. Technology just makes us more efficient in the way that we do things. So it is an offset, but it cannot offset cheap goods, cheap labor, and cheap energy. It cannot offset all of that. It can offset part of that. That's why I've argued when people say, was 9.1% the high in inflation? And I've argued, yeah, I'm open to that idea that it was. Um, or if it does go above it, not much more. But the real question is not, are we at peak inflation? But when inflation trails off, where is it going to go? Um, is it going to go back to two? Or is it going to stall out around four or three or 5%? And I've argued it's going to stall off at around four, three, or five percent. Now, technology is going to help get you to four or three or five, depending on which number it is, but not two, because you still need cheap energy, cheap goods, and and uh, cheap labor to get all the way back to two. So there's been a secular shift in the data. And Jim, what are your thoughts on today's CPI report? Well, what I saw in this report, and I, I used this chart here. The orange line shows you the Wall Street estimate for CPI, and the bars, the blue bars in the top show you what the actual number was, and the bottom panel shows you the difference. And what you'll notice is in the last 19 months, going all the way back to March of 2021, which incidentally was the month that we signed the CARES Act, or the American Recovery Act, excuse me, and we sent out the last STIMI check, we've only seen CPI miss, come in below estimates, two out of 19 times. 12 times CPI has come in above estimates, including this month, this past month, the August CPI that came in. And while I didn't show it, core actually beat by three tenths, which is the highest in 15 months. And it's been on consensus five other times. So what I'm trying to show here is Wall Street is consistently missing on inflation. They consistently tell you it's, transitory, it's peaked, the Fed's going to pivot, and consistently the data does not support that. Why? Because they're not into this idea that there's been a secular shift in cheap goods, cheap labor, cheap energy. Uh, they cannot get their head around this argument. As I've said, I've compared this period to the 1940s. The difference, I've seen, because that was another period of epic change. The difference was September 45, the war ended, World War II ended, and every single person knew it was different. 
We weren't going to go back to our jobs making tanks and fighter planes. We were moving forward. But in 2022, as Wall Street is doing again, no, nothing's different. There is no change. We're waiting for a return to normal. These are the words you hear from Wall Street all the time. This is normal. There is big change. And the longer we argue, are we changing or aren't we changing, the longer Wall Street keeps missing on these inflation numbers, doesn't recognize that there is a secular change underway. Now, the last thing I'll say is, I don't believe this means that we're permanently in a four or 5%, maybe 3% inflation world. And keep in mind, the Fed, I think, correctly identifies neutral funds rate is half a percent above the inflation rate. So if we're four or five, we're talking about four and a half to five and a half just to get the funds rate to neutral. And then the Fed says we have to go well beyond neutral in order to be restrictive to bring down inflation. These are infl interest rates that Wall Street's not ready to get their head around right now. And But if that's where we are, that might be the reality that we face because of the inflation rate that we're looking at. And the problem is Wall Street's not ready to think that there is a secular change in the way. So 2022 is not like 1947. 1947, everybody knew that things had to change. In 2022, we're still arguing whether there should be a change. Now, eventually, when we figure out that there should be a change, we will find other sources of cheap labor, cheap goods, and other sources of cheap. structure the economy. And I'm not so sure we're really starting that right now because we want to argue whether or not there is a secular rise of inflation. And we seem to be focused on the wrong idea. Is 9% the peak? Sure, whatever. But the question is, are we going below three or four when we start going down? That's the real question. And I think we're starting to come around maybe, hopefully, to the idea that no, we're not. And we have to start dealing with a persistently high inflationary world and stop being surprised every 30 days that the inflation rate continues to beat. This is not 2019 anymore. This is 2022. This is the different economy. This is the post-pandemic economy. It is not an economy. Jim, thank you for your thoughts today, and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianco Research, or Arbor Data Science, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks everyone, and have a great week.